Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you may know already, probably know if you've seen us before, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a series for the first three months of 2014 entitled Discipleship. And this is lesson number 11 in that series entitled Discipling Spiritual Leaders. It has to do with how and why Jesus chose his first group of disciples and what happened as a result. You'll find it very interesting. I think we certainly have. So we'd like to ask you now, if you have your Bibles handy, because we always use those, if you will bow your heads with us as we have a word of prayer. Our loving Father, we wish we could have been there to be present to understand all the details of these stories that we read so briefly in the Gospels. We know that you had many discussions, I'm sure, between yourself and Jesus was he, when he was here as a person before you made the choice of these people and why you chose them. We wish we understood more. But now, Lord, since we can't go back there, we ask that you will be with us. Be with those among our church leaders who are uh, working with others to try to choose the best people to lead out in the work in our day. May each one of us do the part that you've chosen for us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many disciples did Jesus have? Many. Define disciple. <laughs> it was a trick question, wasn't it? Um, we, we read about times when he picked 12, and then there's a time later when he picked 70, or se some of the documents have 70, and some of the documents have 72. And then later there was 120 of them right after the, right after the Pentecost. And then uh, a little while later there was 5,000, 3,000, and then 5,000. So, um, yeah, that's a good question. We don't know exactly. And then there's verses like uh, Luke 8, 1 to 3, that talk about a bunch of women who were following. And... We don't know if these numbers that we have from Jesus even count women. We're not sure. So, uh, good question. But certainly, I think all of us would recognize that Jesus was not only a master teacher, but a master trainer. What's the difference between a teacher and a trainer? Have you thought about that? Is there a difference? Yes. Yeah, there is, technically. Teachers tend to share information, knowledge. Trainers tend to teach you how to do certain things, skills and that sort of stuff. So Jesus was clearly doing both. So he, one's verbal and one is action? Is that well, that's the emphasis, at least, uh, the way it's used in our, in our day. Um, looking back at Jesus and the disciples he chose in his day, what do you think were the most important things he needed to teach them? Or were there maybe even more things he needed to unteach them? Is it more difficult to teach people something or more difficult to unteach them? And I, maybe there's a better word for that, but uh, it's sometimes really difficult. I mean, look at the example of the disciples and the, the typical verses I look at is Luke 18, starting with verse 31. The disciples were certain that Jesus was eventually, somehow or other, going to be the Messiah that was going to deliver the Jews from the Romans and maybe even make them the rulers of the world. They knew that had to be the case. I mean, what else? why else would a Messiah come if it wasn't for that purpose? Well, wasn't that the, um, the prophecy as interpreted back then? Yeah. And then when he came, he ended up doing things a little different. <laughs> yeah, a little different, yes. So that was the problem. They had the wrong view of Scripture, the wrong paradigm. Well, what happened is they, there are some passages in, in the Old Testament that we now believe are pointing forward to the second coming and even some to the third coming. And they were trying to wrap the, all the first coming prophecies together with the second coming prophecies together with the third coming prophecies and they came up with this, this conglomerate that seem to really, they wanted, it's what they wanted. The point is, and this is a really good important point for us to, to remember, they believed it because they wanted to believe it. 
they believed it because they wanted to believe that's what was going to happen. So as it happens, Jesus is on his last journey up to Jerusalem. This is just an example of how, how, ter how difficult this can be. He was on his last journey one week before he's crucified. And here, he, look at Luke 18, starting with verse 31. Jesus took the 12 disciples aside and said to them, Listen, we're going to Jerusalem. Does that sound difficult to understand? They're on, the, they're on the road from Jericho up to Jerusalem. Okay, We're going to Jerusalem, where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. Do you think they understood all of it so far? Yes. I don't see how they could not have understood it. He will be handed over to the Gentiles, and all of a sudden their minds are blank because that didn't fit in their, their paradigm. He will be handed over to the Gentiles who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. Now, none of those words are complicated. If you take them by themselves, no question about it, they could have understood every single word. But in terms of the Messiah, this kind of thing happening to the Messiah, could not believe it. And then it goes on, verse 34, but the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. What does the meaning of the words was hidden from them mean? Does that mean uh, by, their, by their worldview, their paradigm, it was hidden, or did God hide it from them? Well, if Jesus is there and explaining it, this is the fourth time okay, that we have recorded. There were probably a lot of other times when he specifically says, and each time he tells them a little bit more, what's going to happen, you know? I mean, I, it's hard, you know, I've asked that question myself a lot. Maybe God didn't want them to understand or something. But Jesus goes out of his way to explain it to them on several occasions. Now, if God didn't want them to understand, why would he have done that? That, I, I, that doesn't compute in my book. Well, God says prophecy is there for when it happens, you will look back and say, oh, that's what the prophecy said. So even today, maybe our minds don't exactly understand the prophecies until they happen, and then they become clear. Okay, so now the disciples have been through the resurrection, been through the crucifixion, been through the resurrection. They've traveled with Jesus and, commu and communed with him for 40 days. And another 10 days, now it's time for the Pentecost. <coughs> Excuse me. And there, you know, you would think, okay, they're just ready for the explosion of the church. They've all come together. Everything's great. And look at this, Acts 1, verse 6. When the apostles met together with Jesus, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time give the kingdom back to Israel? <laughs> they still didn't get it. No, it all went over their head. So okay. They were, they were waiting for the time to happen. Yeah. And so the time was kind of pinching off right then, and, and um, it looks like that would have been a good question to ask. Okay, so you know what's coming next, don't you? How well, many they, things... They should have said, is this when you're going to uh, restore... Yeah. us to the to the rightful or did we misunderstand it before yeah but they didn't ask that last part no and the question which we have to ask if we're going to be honest now is how many things do we believe because we want to believe them that aren't true or wrong timing or whatever like that or we've been taught yes well that's how they were taught too yes that's that's my point. They were taught wrong things. We've been taught wrong things. How do you teach somebody? Here's the next question. How do you teach somebody to be self-sacrificing, ready to live the rest of their lives in hardship, even be willing to die for truths that they believe? How do you, you, you teach that out of a for book? truths that you believe, mm -hmm. that, that's got to be the motivation right mm -hmm. there. So... Tell me about that, then I can answer the other question. Well, we, the, cruise, the truths that we believe would have to be Christianity. 
the truth. I mean, the, what, whatever he, well, somehow truth. Jesus, I mean, look, the question is, look, here Jesus takes a patriot, a, a tax collector, a bunch of fishermen, uh, you know, a collection of odd mixture bunch of people. We don't even know much about most of them. Mm -hmm. And he says, okay, let's get together, let's huddle, and we're going to go out and we're going to win the world. And Jesus dies, and it looks like their world is all over. They're hiding in the upper room because they're sure they're going to be the next one to be crucified. And a few days later, Peter gives a speech, and they're ready to go out and spend the rest of their lives chasing to the end of the world, ready to die. And most, as far as we know, 11 of the 12 disciples ended up being martyrs. Uh, so I how, missed how you, something there. Okay, what did we miss? The resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. Well, that, that's kind of the, yeah. that's pretty important, isn't it? I mean, okay. that kind of... But, but now we know about the resurrection. Kind of changes of, everything. Yeah. Do we know about the resurrection of Jesus? Yes. Are we prepared to die for it? Well, I, I haven't really had another person that I actually knew rise from the dead and actually see him. Yeah. I mean, that's a real experience. Yeah. Um, they had that real I'm expensive. Not, I'm not arguing. That, that was a pretty persuasive. But yeah. remember, think of all the things they had to unlearn. Mm -hmm. We ourselves are just walking pieces of dust. Mm -hmm. um, it takes an I'm infusion. I'm glad you have such a high evaluation of us. Well, <laughs> it takes an infusion of yeah. God's spirit. I mean, there's no way that we can be self-sacrificing on our own. Our inclination is self-preservation. Yeah. And well, there are a number of people who've studied this and even other similar situations, and they have determined that this kind of stuff cannot be taught. It can only be caught. Now, what do we mean by caught? We mean you have to associate with somebody who has this kind of a motivation in their lives, and this is the way they're living, this is the way they're acting all day long, every day, and after a while you say, hmm, this person's got something. How did the first person get it? <laughs> God breathed into mm -hmm. his mouth. Mm -hmm. No, but there are regular people who, soldiers, uh, whatever you did, die for other people, or for uh, president, people are jumping in front of a bullet, and I believe I would die for certain people. Even people I wouldn't know, let's say if I saw a child in danger, I think it would be just instinct. Mm -hmm. But if, I believe so. I think I would die for Jesus, but I wasn't there, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> in an instinct is one thing. The question is, Two. we're now talking about, we're now talking about coming to the end of this world's history, and we're talking about a set of beliefs and convictions about where the world is going and what's going to happen and who's going to come back. Are we prepared to... And, and I had a teacher, some of, some of you know him, for sure many of you probably know him, Dr. Jack Provencia, and one of the questions he used to ask is, okay, how many things that you believe are you willing to die for? Hmm. Well, that's pretty... That's pretty dry. I mean, <laughs> pretty dry. Kinda... It sounds. <laughs> well, would it help anything if you died for him? I mean, well, I mean there, that's the there question. Are... That's the question. You mean there's no reason to die uselessly? But yeah. I mean, well, I, I can tell you my story, and I shouldn't—not my story, but a story of a personal friend of mine, two personal friends of mine that were involved in this story in different ways. Um, a guy heard about this pastor, heard about some about his preaching, and. And he was actually a, 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 a drunk himself and uh, desperate and depressed and so forth. And he knocked on the pastor's door one night at midnight. Saturday night it was, at midnight. And the pastor came to the door and he jammed a gun in his face like this and says, step back. And of course the pastor stepped back like this. So he stood there. He says, call your family out here. And so he called all the family out. I mean, what, what do you do? And they're lined up by the wall over there. And, and the guy says, okay, I have some questions for you. Do you believe in God? Do you believe he's coming back? You know, collect those kinds of questions. And the pastor said, yes, 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 yes. And the guy says, okay, now we're going to find out if you really believe in So he turned the pastor and put the gun right up to his head like this. 
And he said, okay, I'm going to ask you the same questions, and the moment you say yes, I'm going to pull the trigger. Wow. Wow. And now what are you going to do? Well, wow. what if he said yes or no? I mean, let, let's look at that whole business there. Okay. What, what difference does it make? It's only sounds. Yeah, but... It's only... You know, it's like Joan of Arc. She'll say, okay, you, m you might get me to yeah. go against it, but I'll take it back later. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, that, what, means, what that, did this that means your do? word. Well, he said, you know, do you believe in God? And the pastor said, yes. And the guy took his gun and he threw it across the room. He said, I didn't think there was anybody left in the world who really believed anything. And I can tell you, as a result, a number of people became Christians as a result of that story. Mm -hmm. and the, guy who, the guy who came, the, the newspaper reporter who came to report on that story the next day who had been, was a drinker and a smoker and just had all kinds of problems and he was a you know, worldly wise guy and he came to report on that story and uh, started questioning the pastor himself because he didn't. He he basically had the same idea about beliefs as the other guy did, and he ended up being our pastor. Wow! Now could that be the disciples were so close to Jesus they knew it so sure in their heart that people knew they knew, and there was something in the universe that they knew about, and there was no question they knew about it. And do people see that in us? Okay. Now, that's what our focus of our lesson is this time. Because Jesus says he's not only picking people that are faithful followers. What does he want them to do? He wants them to convince a lot of other people to carry this gospel to the whole world. And I've uh, heard someone say before, and I'm inclined to think this is true, that we ought to measure the success of our pastors not by how many people they bring into the church, but how many are brought into the church by the people they brought into the church? You know, sometimes I wonder about martyrism, if it is completely a person's decision. What if it's the, whole, the spirit actually uh, gives part of that strength to be that way? I'm thinking about Stephen when he got stoned. I mean, he wasn't th sitting there thinking about I mean, his mind was almost somewhere else, yeah. and he didn't really care what they were going to do to him. So I'm, I'm just kind of wondering if, if it's all something we got to muster up inside, you know, to, well, to make that yeah. happen. It, it, it's interesting to look. There's a number of stories. I mean, here's Stephen. He, knows, he knew what was going on. He knew what was in those people's minds. He had been to the synagogues. He'd probably argued with those same bunch of people from the Sanhedrin on a number of occasions. And they realized that this guy could beat them in any argument. And Paul was probably there too. In fact, we know Paul was there. He was holding people's coats. And you, you can, if you read through uh, that story, and, and uh, that's what, Acts uh, 7, read through his sermon, and you go through there and you can see at a certain point he realizes that, that he said about as much as they're going to let him say. And so he sort of jumps to his punchline and they just go ballistic. Yeah, you know, when I read that, it kind of looks like they didn't, he didn't see people with rocks in their hands. He saw the Lord coming yeah. through from, from heaven. I mean, it wasn't that how he many, was just how trying How many big to, rocks have to hit you in your head before you don't see anything? Well, that, that's not really my point. My point is that, that, um, that his mind was almost somewhere else you yeah. know even though there were people just yelling at him screaming at him and throwing things at him he, he wasn't even looking at but, that he was looking at this vision he was seeing he, he says he saw the man, son of God coming through the yeah. clouds but let's let's not pick Stephen now Stephen was not a disciple he was a deacon what about Peter who was crucified upside down he had a while to think about that didn't he what about Paul who ended up you know, think of all the things that Paul went through but, but and ends still, up being, that, getting his head cut off. Couldn't that still have a little bit of a valid, valid wouldn't that still be valid for them, them also? Well, th that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. yeah. What, what 
I mean, these are people, I think if you had walked along the, the shore of the Sea of Galilee and said, there's four fishermen out here, I wonder if those guys can change the world. I mean, you would say, huh? I mean, wouldn't we really? And a tax collector. Would you say, this guy's going to change the world? He's going to write a book that literally millions and millions of people are going to read and it's going to change their lives? But it's almost like he pl all those people plugged into something, though. Yes. Yeah. That's and, what we're talking that's, about. That's pretty important. I mean, yeah, you could look at all these people, but, but you know, you have to look at them being plugged into the, the Spirit, and then they do all this fantastic yeah. stuff. Well, look so. at the disciples. When Judas is killed, when Judas basically commits suicide, and Jesus, Pentecost is over, and they, I mean, before Pentecost, apparently, they said, we can't be just 11, we have to be 12. Why did they say that? Was that a complete number in the Jewish system? If you're having a Jewish group and you're, you want to go out and as a team, you've got to have 12. Mm -hmm. That was their thinking. And have 11. And what about, if you're playing football, you can have 11. But if you're not, if you're going to be a Jewish group, okay? Uh, so, but what about... Uh, we, we, they chose Judas, Barsabbas. What about uh, Matthias? I'm sorry, they chose Matthias. What about Judas Barsabbas? Don't you think he would have been a perfectly good choice? No, he, was, he was not the Judas that went out and hung no. himself. This no. was a, this so is the Judas one. was a common name? A fair, yeah, Judas, Judas in Greek is Judah in Hebrew. You know, they were all Jews. Jews is a... Oh, okay. And, and Judy today... Oh. The name, the female name Judy, means a Jewess. Okay. So it's that name. Okay. Um, so he probably continued as he had before as a faithful follower, but we don't know. Yeah, and probably the hundred and twenty who were there in the upper room, and then the five thousand. I mean, I think probably all of them went out, and. Because after the stoning of Stephen, there was a time of persecution and the disciples scattered and everywhere they went, they were preaching the gospel. Well, so now, back to our question. Is it possible? Is it possible when Jesus is about to... You know, he prayed all night. Oh, well, let's look at that verse, okay? Um, I'm sorry, I got the wrong one here. Um... Is this, how long before he cr is crucified is this? No, I, this, is, this is way before he's crucified. When he's choosing his 12 disciples, I had it here somewhere. But anyway, uh, oh, it's Luke 6, I believe. Let's see if we can find it real quick. Well, anyway, we won't bother with it. But we know that he prayed all night, the night before he chose his disciples. What do you suppose was happening at that time? With him or with his disciples? With his. With him. He's, he's praying all night. He's getting ready to choose his disciples. What do you think happened? Well, he was... What was he praying about, do you think? Are we asking God for guidance that he chooses the right group? Okay. How much does God know about each of those 12 disciples? Everything. Every hair on their head. Everything. Do you think Jesus and his father discussed not only the past history of these disciples, but maybe the future history of these disciples? Quite possible. God could have told him that if he said, you need one of these. And there's a very interesting thing that, that uh, I learned in a, in a class course I took at Johns Hopkins University on group dynamics. If you want a group that get along fine and, and can agree on common things pretty easily, you pick a bunch of people that are very much alike. And they'll do just fine. They'll pick things and they all think alike. But if you want a, if you want a group that's really going to get you the best answers, you pick a bunch of really diverse people and they will have at each other. I mean, assuming they all feel comfortable. And they will go at it and, so, and none of them will be happy with the results, but the answers will be better than you get from the group who are all alike. Mm. Because there's a variety, there's a more variety of thinking, and it's very. It looks like that's exactly what Jesus did. He, I mean, look at a zealot. What what were the zealots trying to do? Just for an example. 
the zealots were a determined group of people that were, that, that were ready to say, okay, we're going to destroy these Romans or we're going to die. Okay, so here's a zealot, and standing next to him is Matthew, who's a tax collector for the Romans. Not I mean, exactly the same ideas. Right? Not exactly the not same. Not <laughs> exactly the same kind of thinking, right? Well, not only that, but if you think about it, if Jesus went and picked all car salesmen, yeah. all 12 of them car salesmen, well, then what are ship captains going to do? Yeah. I mean, you've got to have this diversity so it'll, yeah. it'll cover all kinds of times of people. Yeah. By the way, Jesus praying all night it was Luke 6, 12, and 13. Yeah, I knew it was Luke 6. 12, verses 12 and 13 where it talks about. Thank you, Gordon. Um, is there any evidence as Jesus chose these 12 that he said, okay, you're going to be the leader? Or you're going to be the leader? Uh, leadership kind of develops through talents, right? You have to, I mean, they have to become well, it's apparent before yeah. you can even make leadership. Okay, you can't just is say. Is that what Christ was talking to his father about the night before? Maybe. But think about it. Apparently, D -G -D Jesus did choose three of them that he spent more time with. Who were the three? Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. And when the church got itself organized, and we come to Acts 15, they had the first general conference. Who was the leader? Jesus' brother. Be was careful. Jesus' brother, whose name was also James. By the way, that wasn't his real name. His real name was? Judas. Um, I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jacob. Jacob yeah, his real right. name was Jacob, but... All the they decided there were too many James. Jacobs in the Bible, so whoever started translating in English said, all the Jacobs in the New Testament, we're going to call them James instead of Jacob. Just an arbitrary decision on somebody's part. Hmm. So, um, when you read James in the New Testament, think Jacob. Okay? <laughs> anyway, um, you know, and, and you go back to John chapter 7, and... These brothers, in fact, there's plenty of evidence that his brothers gave Jesus a really hard time growing up and they didn't want to believe in him and they kept trying to tell him what to do and he wasn't doing things right and da-da-da. And then all of a sudden he goes through that weekend of dying and rising from the dead and so forth and suddenly there's his mother and there's his brothers and they're leaders in the group. And they wrote two of the books of the New Testament. You well, might do that, too, if you saw your brother rise from the dead. <laughs> <laughs> you think that might affect us if yes, we saw something? Yes. Yeah, well, so now let's, let's get down to the nitty-gritty. What, what tools do we have to work with? What, what, um, where do we go if we want to know how to choose, to, be, to choose and to be the right kind of uh, leaders in, in our day? Now, Christian leaders, church leaders. Are you saying how do we choose church leaders? Or well, how, do we how should they be chosen? Let me put it in the passive. I mean, what are the, what are the tools? We have Bible study. Mm -hmm. We have prayer. We have witnessing. See how well they do work, witnessing and service and other kinds of service rounds. We can look at that. If we, I mean, just take ordinary nominating co committee. What can they look at? What kind of evidence can they look at? Those things, right? Yeah. And then the next question is, of course, we believe that the Holy Spirit is supposed to guide us. So how does the Holy Spirit work with the Bible study and the prayer? And Well, it's, it's kind of all providential in the end. Mm -hmm. I mean... After you get a leader that you got what you got, mm -hmm. and he, he becomes history, and you start studying that history. <laughs> yeah. How long had Jesus been working with these 12 before he chose them? About a year and a half or two years, wasn't it? Two years before he officially chose them. And they sort of followed him for a while, and then they go back. I mean, from the time when he was baptized by John, and some of them... Some of them were there, and, and not all of them, but some of them were there, and they, they started telling others, and they started following Jesus, and they would follow him for a little while, and they would go back. And, and, 
Well, maybe it's the same for our church leaders. We should get to know the person yeah, for possible. some period of time before we um, offer a call to, to leadership. Christianity is a very rational religion. We believe that you can look at the evidence and you can make sense. Now, there are some who have a forms of Christianity which aren't very rational, but in general, the scriptures is a very rational kind of thing. It's reasonable. Um, how does that fit in with the problem of choosing and of becoming leaders and of choosing leaders? Do we, uh, like some Christian groups, do we say you, you can't be a church leader unless you talk in tongues? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know if the religion and the Bible are considered rational in our day. I mean, it's getting to be less and less the guideline for our population. So I think we're a peculiar people following the Bible anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, so the person we choose as a leader should be grounded in the Bible do um, you think that it's more important to choose someone who has a, a full knowledge of the scriptures and grounded in the beliefs, or is it more important to have someone who has experience? Experience in what? Well, in church activities. You know, this the leadership former. thing seems to just float above our heads, and I don't know if we really get any choice on the leaders I guess I haven't been at that level, so it's kind of stumping me mm -hmm. how you choose leaders because... You have a choice who you follow. That, yeah, you have a choice. Okay, now, are you talking about leaders that I choose to follow? Well, that would be ultimately the question, wouldn't it? Uh-huh. Well, I think, like I said, there's someone that seems to be grounded in the Bible. I don't care mm -hmm. if their, uh, their personality isn't um, outgoing or if they are not charismatic. Um, I like to listen to someone who knows what they're talking about. Okay. Jesus started, well, let's say, that he basically started his Galilean mission. He spent a year of intensive work in Galilee. And that was, that's the year we know the most about. And at the beginning of that year, he gave that incredible sermon that we find in Matthew 5 to 7, and probably a lot more, because he probably preached all day long. That sermon you can read in about five minutes, uh, what, the part that we have. Um, and we know, we, we, we've heard lots of sermons about that, but, but look at Luke 6, which apparently is talking about the same time period, the same experience, and, but he seems to put things in different terms. Look at Luke 6, chapter, starting with verse 20. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, Happy are you poor. The kingdom of God is yours. Are the poor, I mean, w would any of us have said that? No. And they would not have said it in that day either. No. They, they knew for sure that if you were a good person, God would bless you, and if you're blessed, you would have more, God would, he would give you money. So if you're driving down the street in a Mercedes, you're a good person. They knew that. So what do you think they, you know, when Jesus says, happy are you poor, and they're going, huh? <laughs> well, look at the next one. Happy are you who are hungry now. Huh? Happy are you who weep now. I mean, it's getting worse, isn't it? <laughs> happy are you when people hate you. I mean, this is real peer group stuff, right? reject you, insult you, and say that you are evil, all because of the Son of Man. What, what, I mean, how is that to start out a, a sermon? You're, you're, you, you show up on the platform, this is your first Sabbath, you're preaching to the, to the audience, and you want, you know, you want them to like you, right? Why would you say a thing like this? Jesus is telling people there's more to you than this world and I think he was trying to paint a picture of God will um, treat the poor as if they are rich mm -hmm. spiritually 
Well, all those people know they need something. Mm -hmm. And the other people who are happy, of course, <laughs> they're okay, you know. There's, they're, they're not going to shake the bushes for anything. Well, he, he goes on. He condemns the rich, the full, those who are laughing, those who are respected. He condemns those people. Is it because they don't feel any need, as Gary suggested? And maybe they're not very nice to other people. Yeah, very likely. Well, it's almost like he's saying, well, don't look to those people because, you know, <laughs> there's more to everything than that. I mean, look at everything. Was he trying to upset the apple cart of their thinking? Kind of sounds like it, doesn't it? Well, there are a number of Christian churches who have what they call a creed. What is a creed? A doctrine you live by. <laughs> uh, so uh, kind of a motto. Yeah. It's almost like a Boy Scout motto, right? Something like that. It comes actually from the Latin for I believe, called the Latin for I believe is credo. So that's where the word creed is. This, this is what I believe. Do you know what the Adventist creed is? I don't think I've ever heard it. <laughs> you I mean like to, motto? I hate to say it might be some number that starts with 20, 28 beliefs. Yeah. I'm very happy to say that in Review and Herald, December 15, 1886, which is copied in Selected Messages, Book 1, page 416, oh. Ellen White said, the Bible and the Bible alone is to be our creed. What do you, what do you think she meant by that? Now here, this is, I mean, Boy Scout motto, isn't this the thing that's supposed to inspire to go out and give your life or whatever, do whatever you have to do, rush into the burning building or whatever? Well, the so, Bible is what God gave us. Mm -hmm. And so it is our all in all. It is our creed. Sounds a little bit like Martin Luther's Sola Scriptura. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Bible and the Bible only? Yeah. Um, well, the thing with the creed, though, isn't it because it's, it's short and simple that yeah. you uh, remember it? I guess um, she was not for something short and simple. She wanted to make sure that everything complete. was complete. Yeah. Well, we Adventists have uh, gone one step further, and we say that's a special part of the scriptures that we stand for. What is it? Three Angel angels' message. message. The three angels' messages. How many sermons have you heard recently about the three angels' messages? Too many. <laughs> On TV? We don't hear people talking about them very much anymore, do we? Huh? They had them on the signs of all the churches. <laughs> Maybe that's all they needed. <laughs> I see. All you need is three angels flying on the signs outside, huh? Yeah. Well, isn't the three angel message is the gospel, and the gospel is the Bible. So when we're talking yeah. about the yeah. Bible, we're talking about the three angels message. I would put it like this. In order to really understand the three angels message and certainly to represent those messages correctly, when you want to teach it to someone else, you have to know the rest of the Bible. Yes. Especially coming from in other churches, especially the Old Testament. The Old Testament adds so much um, uh, quality mm -hmm. to the New Testament that, and some churches leave out the Old Testament, that you are really missing a lot without mm -hmm. a study of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is not studied that much these days. Yeah. We mentioned, uh, Gordon mentioned solo, solo the, scripture. Uh -huh, scripture only alone. But is the scripture as we have it now the way it was or supposed to be? Yes. Um, that's a very complicated subject. I once gave, I think, what, 25 lectures or something on our website. By the way, if you are interested in any of these materials we talk about, uh, all our study guides that we talk about here on our program, etc., are available on our website. Um, 
It's Theox, that's Theological Crossroads, T-H-E-O-X. Uh, you can probably see the logo on this program. Uh, go there and you'll, you'll find these materials under Sabbath School or under whichever department you're interested in looking at. Um, and also the history of the Bible lessons yeah. were very interesting. Yes, those are also in there. And basically the answer is the people who have taken seriously the, the challenge of trying to determine the answer to that question, pe there's a lot of people who basically spend most of their lives and, and the answer is yes. We have probably 99.9 percent .9 of what the original authors wrote, you know, well translated into modern languages. Yes. But don't you think that that was kind of a charge back in a time where there were people holding the traditions, mm -hmm. and uh, which isn't so much the problem now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I keep thinking about all the people in the Bible that didn't have a Bible. Yeah. Well, what are they supposed to do? They didn't have a Bible to read, and yet, you know, the, they were learning about God. You think of Jesus, um, talking about how much you know about the Bible, you think of Jesus came today and had to pick 12 disciples, what kind of people would he pick? Would he stick with the poor in our day, or would he pick all PhDs in New Testament or Old Testament? Or He might pick one of each. <laughs> Yeah, I think you're right. That's yeah. a good answer. Yeah, I think the that uh, he he would pick for he would look for a variety of people with different ideas. Yeah. So probably Paul and Luke would have been chosen if Jesus could have chosen them. Um, could you have been a disciple? Would Jesus pick you? <laughs> You know, when Jesus was picking, he and God, they know our insides. And we have these capacities for God inside us. And so they probably picked the people who had the largest capacity for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And whether that person be of what nationality, of richness or poorness or whatever, that's probably what they were looking for is an acceptance of the Spirit inside the person. Because without that, you can't do anything. Yeah. Well, there was a lot of times when they were arguing over who was the greatest. I don't yeah. know what kind of a person that would be to have to argue well, about that. That, yeah. that argument sort of <laughs> disappeared after the Pentecost, didn't it? Or after the crucifixion? But all during the time of Jesus' ministry, they, they yeah. argued about it all, yep. all the time. Well, look at this quotation. It's found in Desire Pages, first paragraph on page 250. Jesus chose unlearned fishermen because they had not been schooled in the traditions and erroneous customs of their time. So what's he looking for? Clean slates. People who don't have a bunch of wrong ideas already, a, 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 a wrong paradigm. They were men of native ability and they were humble and teachable, men whom he could educate for his work. In the common walks of life, would that be even now? There is many a man patiently treading the round, and I would add women, patiently treading the round of daily toil, unconscious that he or she possesses powers which, if called into action, would raise him to an equality with the world's most honored men. The touch of a skillful hand is needed to arouse those dormant faculties. It was such men that Jesus called to be his co-laborers, and he gave them the advantage of association with himself. How, how, how would you like to spend three and a half years under the best teacher in the world has ever seen? Never had the world's great man such a teacher. When the disciples came forth from the Savior's training, they were no longer ignorant and uncultured. They had become like him in mind and character, and men took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus, Acts 4.13. That, they that wasn't at the time of the crucifixion no, that way. It was no. 50 it was days later. later and after that. Yes. That they might have success in their work, they were to be given the power of the Holy Spirit. Not by human might or human wisdom was the gospel to be proclaimed, but by the power of God. And of course, I'm sure you recognize Zechariah 4, 6 there. And that's found in Acts of the Apostles, page 17, also by Ellen White. So... 
Well, on, um, Jesus also can pick a very educated person because wasn't it Paul that was the Pharisee of the Pharisees? Yeah. And he had all sorts of training, and Jesus had to hit him upside of the ma uh, the yeah. head, blind him, and uh, and get mm -hmm. his attention. And, and then, then he had to go study for a long time to change. Then all he his went views. to the wilderness to mm -hmm. study, yeah. and uh, he came out uh, on fire because he he put he rearranged all the little blocks. His apple cart was upset, and he restacked them up, and uh, he discovered truth. Mm -hmm. So maybe he picked the fisherman because he didn't have enough time to make <laughs> these other guys unlearn what they learned yeah. and then start over again to get going. Yeah. So, well, uh, look at Zechariah chapter 2, verse 3. It's the next, the last book. No, I'm Ze sorry. Zechariah or Zephaniah? Zephaniah. I'm sorry. Zephaniah 2, verse 3. It's, what, four books in from the end of the Old Testament? Turn to the Lord, all you humble people of the land who obey his commands. Do what is right and humble yourselves before the Lord. Perhaps you will escape punishment on the day when the Lord shows his anger. So right. what kind of people? Humble. 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 Now, didn't they say Jesus was humble and also Moses was one of the most humble people that ever lived? Yeah. Now, what exactly is being humble? What is humility? That, well, that is a to trait. to define it, it's a, it's a person who's always willing to let others go ahead of him. He's a person who says... Even at potluck? I'm not, even at potluck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, He's now a, nobody's going to get to the line. <laughs> now, now you're going to meddling. <laughs> yeah. You're trying to, get, you're trying to get this potluck over with. Let's go eat. <laughs> no, you got to go first. <laughs> so it's someone that doesn't think uh, highly of themselves that uh, Jesus had... Well, to they're not people who crowd to the front. Not people who crowd to the front. If you read Zephaniah 2, 3, which we read, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jeremiah 50, verse 31, and Isaiah 57, 15, those are just some of the verses that are mentioned, it's very clear that God is not looking for a bunch of proud people. Well, it sounds like humility is, is a teachable person. Yeah. Right? The That's opposite, basically The it. opposite of pride, selfishness. But yet... Yeah. Um... I'm thinking about Jesus as a student. As a child. <laughs> yeah, as a child. Okay, maybe. Yeah, okay. Okay, that would you probably mean? work. Oh, sorry. So humility would be selflessness, mm -hmm. and pride would be selfish, exalting, ex exaltation, selfishness. Yeah. Now, Jesus called, wasn't it the rich, we call him the rich young ruler? Mm -hmm. You know, all these laws I've kept from my youth up. What one thing do I lack? Mm -hmm. Jesus told him, go and sell all that you have. And mm -hmm. which, which brings my next question up. Do you think any scribes or, I mean, or Pharisees or Sadducees would have accepted to be a disciple if he had, Jesus had called them? That one didn't. So none of Paul did. Yes. So there was no religious leader of the day who became a disciple? Not in the early days. Not in the early days. But it's interesting to look at a couple of passages. Look at Acts chapter 6, verse 7. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests accepted the faith. Okay? So now look at Acts 15, verse 5. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, da, 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 da. Some of the believers from the party of the Pharisees. So there were priests, there were Pharisees who became believers. Now yeah, we know the names of uh, Nicodemus mm -hmm. in John 3 and, and at the time of the burial and so on. Mm -hmm. We don't hear of him later on. How come? He didn't do any writing, I guess. And Joseph of Arimathea. You mm -hmm. know, those were prominent uh, Pharisees. Ellen White says that Nicodemus ended up spending all of his money for the promotion of the gospel, and he died a poor man. If that's of any help. Okay. So, I mean... What do you think it was that convinced Nicodemus? 
I mean, if there hadn't been any, you know, let's say, peer pressure against it, he would have been a disciple, wouldn't he? Aha. Uh -huh. That's <laughs> something we have to overcome even today. There's a lot of peer pressure against being a Christian and a Seventh-day Adventist. Mm -hmm. And so are we Nicodemus sort of um, halfway being, being a Christian at night. Mm -hmm. He came to Jesus at night, didn't he? Yes. yes. He asked Jesus to meet him at night. Well, why do you think Jesus didn't go out of his way to pick well-educated people? Well, Ellen White said he wanted um, to fill them himself. He didn't have the time necessary to unteach a bunch of people. Just teach. He had a hard enough time with that. Well, we know he had, he had to unteach some things even to his disciples. We already read the verses from, you know, Luke 18 and Acts 1. Yeah. Hmm. So how, how effective do you think Jesus was in picking these disciples? Did he do a good job? Excellent. Except for Judas. Except for Judas. Did he pick Judas? Well, if you go to Ellen White, the answer is no. She says Judas decided that this was probably the, the, the future Messiah and he wanted to be a part of the group. And Jesus said, okay, foxes have their holes and birds have their nests, but you know, but if you want to come, you can come. So Judas chose that position for himself. So how effective was Jesus? Did he do a good job in picking out these future church leaders? It wasn't apparent in the first three years. <laughs> but yeah. going to the end of their generation, he was yes. very successful. So think about this. I mean, there are poetry, poems written about this, but here's a, a, a young man who grew up in a despised village in a remote backwater part of the Roman Empire and yet no one at that time, no other person in anywhere, I don't care if they were a senator or, or an emperor, none of them had even close to the amount of impact on the human race mm -hmm. as Jesus did. And he, here he is off in this remote corner of the Babylonian Empire, I mean of the Roman Empire. Why did he have such an impact? Because Somehow he chose the right disciples and taught them the right things. Okay. Probably helped that he had a little better genetics, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who had genetics? Jesus. He had better genetics? Yes. You think that would do it? Who was, who was his father? Um. <laughs> you think that has anything to do with it? Well, if he's got genetics, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I know what you mean, though. Yeah. Well, um, and, um, and the truth is, he spent a lot of time in communion with his father. Yeah. Well, do we know anything about Matthias Math or Matthias, the... the representative that the disciples chose, did he suddenly become a shining light? He could have been, but nothing was written about it. We know nothing about him. Wouldn't we have loved to have I, I, uh, phones and uh, cameras yeah. during those days? Yeah. You know, the, the reason why Paul is so prominent may just be the fact that he wrote. Mm -hmm. You know, there might That's have been some been. people, there might be, we might find out that there were some powerhouses, some other people we haven't even heard of because they didn't write about them. Mm -hmm. It's possible. Well, here's a, a, a comment from Ellen White, Acts of the Apostles, page 22 and 23. As Christ's representatives, the apostles were to make a decided impression on the world. The fact that they were humble men would not diminish their influence, but increase it. How could that be? The minds, uh, I'm sorry, for the minds of their hearers would be carried from them to the Savior, who, through, though unseen, was still working with them. The wonderful teaching of the apostles, their words of courage and trust, would assure all that it was not in their own power that they worked, but in the power of Christ. 
Remember that Jesus said, let your light so shine that they will do what? Glorify your Father in heaven, Matthew 16, right? Then are we asking for God to work through us to let our sh light shine in this world so that people will praise uh, the God that we follow, the Bible that we read? Uh, and what, what do you think would happen if one of us sitting around this table, for example, or anyone listening out there, suddenly decided, or, or for that matter, if God had call, called us to be another Paul, a Paul in our day, what, what, what would you do? Well, knowing Paul's life, I would be scared to death. But uh, when God fills you with energy, you just seem to... Uh, Move on anyway, huh? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Well, when Jesus called his first 12 disciples, he sent them out to do what? Remember? To harvest. Mm -hmm. To harvest. But he sent them into places where he had already been and prepared the harvest. So they're just to go out and really enter into the work that he had already prepared. Uh, again, from Ellen White, here's um, Desire of Ages, page 351. All over the field of Christ's labor, there were souls awakened to their need and hungering and thirsting for truth. The time had come to send the tidings of his love to these, to these longing hearts. To all these, the disciples were to go as his representatives. The believers would be led to look upon them as divinely appointed teachers, and when the Savior should thus be taken from them, they would not be left without instructors. On this first tour, that was the question I asked, the disciples were to go only where Jesus had been before them and had made friends. He basically prepared the field. Their preparation for the journey was to be of the simplest kind. Nothing must be allowed to divert their minds from their great work or in any way excite opposition and close the door for future labor. Desire of Ages, page 351. Well, we've already mentioned the fact that he later chose 70, and then there was 120, and he chose a bunch of women as well. Um, some of us in our day, older and more experienced, we, tend, we, we, we seem to call ourselves despair as we look at the young generation coming behind us. But remember, those young people that are coming behind us are someday going to be the church leaders. Are we helping them? Are we helping to prepare them? Um, today, most of our church leaders are chosen by committees. Is that the best way to do it in our day? Well, we run out of time, but I would like to ask, would Jesus choose you?